one two three one two three i hope we are live it is 7 p.m and i just clicked go live we will see uh hello everyone let me just check youtube if it is live indeed it is super nice so hello everyone i have always this strange feeling when i'm clicking go live and nothing is happening i am full of rights that a facebook again crashed or something but it seems that at least now it is working so hello everyone in this webinar the next one webinar in the topic of the memory management in general and today we will be talking about the course that i'm preparing i thought it will be interesting thank you richard for the answer that for the question that i was just going to ask if you hear me well but uh, you said that it's working fine so i thank you for for doing that uh self say, say hello as always from where you are from which country uh, and uh, uh, just wave to me like i'm waving to you as uh, we will be talking today about interesting topics so i'm super happy that you are here with me today okay uh, what's the agenda for today we will see in a moment and uh, that's the sp simply think uh, and just the main uh, topic is the course itself and the idea that was behind the course and why me as an author why i believe it i'm good enough author for it and also some sneak peeks uh, from the course itself uh, so just take your popcorn and watch later on but not only watch at uh, the very first slide i just added it very at the very beginning just to make sure i will not forget feel free to ask questions discuss um, if it is a question about the course itself or maybe in the not that memory management topic no bad questions <clears throat> i will try to answer some of them like all, all of them i will try to answer if i am able to answer if I not i will answer later on or maybe you can inspire me with uh, some topic that i should still add to the course itself so you can have big influence on this product too uh, hello from hello from India, from Czech Republic, from India again, and uh, I, that's all from from now. I see also that Bartek is probably from Poland. Uh, at least uh, maybe you are in Poland now. Okay, hello, uh, hello. I'm in Poland too, so <clears throat> we are from various time zones. Do not do not do not delay it longer. Let's move on so um, i thought okay that's kind of different webinar not so super technical so i thought maybe i will introduce myself it's also a little bit from a little bit different perspective uh, to make it a little bit more personal because this whole webinar is a little bit more personal than, than others so just a few things about me from different point of view first of all for example i would like to add that i'm a big photography fan maybe you are too like i love photography and uh, it's something that is in my heart from many years to the point that i left it totally for one year and i was a professional photographer doing with weddings photography cooperating with agencies and uh, <clears throat> writing reviews of software so uh, on the right side uh, i'm here during the review of various photography backpacks <laughs> and uh, on the left playing with some uh, from which some uh, zoom lens which it lens which is not mine unfortunately but it was really nice so photography is one of the main like the main hobby that i was having i am having and I'm returning to it. It has some upside downs. And uh, sometimes I'm a little more involved. Uh, sometimes I'm not with some delay uh, breaks, but I love it. Maybe you are too. Uh, another thing is that I'm a hiking adept. Like uh, I'm not a kind of the physical sportsman. So the any activity is not so let's say common to me but thanks to my wife I, I i start to love mountains and we were visiting polish mountains for months and i started to like it like i really was able to climb somewhere and view the beautiful landscapes and i i it connects with my photography hobby also and uh, 
I love it. So uh, maybe we will meet somewhere on on the trails, uh, however it is called. Uh, as I I started to love it to the point that I'm really thinking with my wife to move closer to the mountains because unfortunately from Warsaw where we are based currently it is like four or five hours to be in the Tatra mountains that's too much like we are not able to be there every weekend for example so uh, another thing is um, I'm awful I'm not sure if you know what it is but it is a shortcut of adult fan of Lego because I was a fan of Lego from the very first rememberings I have hello from India and hello from India again uh, so the Lego is also in my heart uh, and I decided to return to it uh, two or two years ago or so as you know I was playing with it for years as a child and I love it uh, I loved it a lot and then I used to be started to become this super serious adult that is not playing with uh, tools for any time more and then I decided okay but there is a big space for being adult uh, Lego fan uh, and that's uh, I decided to return to it like Lego is a little bit more than just a toy like it is something like we could even say in an artistic way of expressing like photography or sculpture uh, and it connects with my other hobbies too like for example here is the proposition of my uh, joke on Lego site that we should create the Lego set of RTX because it is so unavailable that maybe a Lego set will be just a good contribution to the community <clears throat> And by the way, I'm targeting this Lego Ideas site. I'm not sure if you know, but every every person can uh, submit its own Lego proposal on Lego Ideas. They are votes, and if your proposal gets enough votes, it will be considered by Lego Group to be published and simply available on stores. Uh, so I'm trying to do that. Maybe I will do that in the ne nearest years. Sorry, something bad happening is out outside. So. Uh, I hope it will end soon. <clears throat> uh, uh, so uh, Lego is absolutely <laughs> outstanding. Fine. I'm not playing with Lego like with you know fighting my figure figure Lego sets uh, figure mini figures with each other. Just creating stuff uh, as a kind of a creative activity. But okay. Uh, in the end, the most important thing is for uh, for you probably, and that's why we are here today, that I'm a .NET developer and I love it. Like I love developing things and hello from South Africa. <laughs> Super nice to, so to see someone from, from South Africa. Uh, so I haven't been there yet. Uh, if you have any .NET conferences, please give me a hint. Where should I apply? I would love to visit your your site, uh, your, your, your country where we are living. So <laughs> maybe there is a .NET conference. I could be there and talk about .NET. So I'm .NET developer and uh, I love it. And that's why we are here today during this webinar. Mm. And I'm mostly related dedicated to stuff which is around performance and memory management that's the course that we are today having and the whole idea about the dotnet memory expert course so let's move smoothly to the idea of the course itself uh, like the dotnet memory expert <clears throat> So uh, I would like to point that I really believe in pragmatic approach to .NET memory management. So although I spent years doing this stuff, I'm not any kind of a freak that believes everyone should write code in using pointers and span and stack alloc. Obviously, that's super fun, but this abuses <laughs> programming in general, makes it unsafe and hard to maintain. So I believe in this pragmatic approach in .NET memory management and in general in .NET programming. And what it is, like, I like to see that there are various levels on which uh, you can perceive .NET memory management. The level one, which we could also, uh, let's say it is a junior level, the, the code name, let's make it junior level, 
it's about some basic sanity checks like use struct here instead of a class maybe or don't use linku here because it may be on hold path so maybe using linku here is not so beneficial or maybe you know that the list has a capacity and simply it allows to avoid some allocations just like that because it is just a few characters in your code so this is a level about kind of clean code for performance when you try to write a code you think about maintaining it to be kind of nice and don't look like a mess and that's from the clean code perspective and that would be something uh, that that would be the level that we i would like to see for everyone and it requires some kind of knowledge about abstractions what the gc is some basic sanity checks to have some kind of muscle memory to know what you should really not to do and like no brainers simply that's the thing that you know when you are writing you know design patterns and why not to know some basic performance related stuff <clears throat> the level two which would be code named mid uh, would be will be about a little bit more advanced obviously stuff but not still not super advanced like it would be only to know some a little bit more no knowledge of abstractions for example how how what are the gc modes in dotnet and how you can change them and why they are designed and for what they are designed and moreover not only that you should know at that level how to measure things and how you can diagnose things if something bad happens uh, so it will be not only about code itself uh, just to make this working compiling and not allocating like a crazy but also about the whole bigger picture about your application okay it is hosted somewhere but does it allocate like a crazy or not how i should measure that how i can diagnose something if i find some bottlenecks and that's not the magical knowledge for uh, you know experts living somewhere in the towers but it is also something that everyone could benefit on the everyday work so that's the mid level level two then we will be moving to level three which will be for kind of seniorish level a code named because it will be start we will be start to think about optimizing things like <clears throat> maybe not understanding what should be optimized so we don't know need to have this knowledge about measuring because we need to know what are the bottlenecks and why there are uh, but here we like to have, have some knowledge how we can optimize it how cool how we could write code that is a uh, more memory aware some advanced c sharp tips and tricks so maybe here a little bit of span or string dot create because we have something like that and uh, we need to understand why we should apply it or where so that would be kind of seniorish level which requires also a little bit more of maybe a little even a, some internal knowledge about the, the gc but still not at the super sophisticated level <clears throat> and only there we have the expert level which is as uh, that ex level where maybe a few people on the planet are interested in when you for example implement your own gc because you want to replace the original one or maybe you want to write a book about it or maybe uh, you simply love it so much and you want to be an expert which will be really paid for this knowledge that's super valid that's what i'm doing and if you would want to have it obviously this is also possible uh, and I believe like we have those four levels maybe you can agree maybe not you can even say on chat on which level you are seeing yourself but why i'm talking about it all here so moving forward if you have a, some kind of code to write uh, there is the whole process and uh, as i mentioned there are those levels but we can look at it from this perspective there is this process of writing code so uh the very first thing that i would like to uh, give you as a kind of golden rule or ru rule of thumb is that you should not be paralyzed by the performance code like sometimes i'm seeing that if people start to be interested in performance they immediately start to be paralyzed but oh, i i'm afraid of writing any single line of code because it will be for sure uh uh for sure will be 
uh, not optimal. It will allocate too much or something. That that reminds me also the, the 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 same when you start to learning about design patterns and you you are really afraid of writing any single line of code because you immediately know it will suck. It will be not maintainable, and you think what design patterns you can put there just to make it better. So the same thing, uh, as you probably know, is not good for the clean code and design patterns, the same thing here. Don't be paralyzed by high performance code. Start from working prototype. And that's fine, that's what I'm also doing. Even if I'm going to write some optimized code, I'm not paralyzed. I'm writing something that compiles that will be able to pass some tests and then I will start to measure, for example, and optimize hot paths and so on. So that, that will be the programmatic thing. But still, uh, the same like for design patterns, uh, having some sanity checks and some kind of muscle memory will allow you to avoid simply stupid mistakes. Like if after many years of programming, you will eventually learn that global variables are not good and singleton maybe also is not so good pattern. You will just try to avoid singletons and simply the same may happen in programming here. Um, like if you make a, a SQL query, you will start to think where those data will simply, what is the data flow of it? Do you, do you, uh, uh, you whether it is downloading the whole table <laughs> to be filtered on the client side, or maybe there is a kind of batching, what will be general memory pressure of it and so on. So um, that is nice. And that is somewhere uh, at the level one, I believe, like everyone can have this kind of muscle memory for these very common stupid mistakes. <clears throat> And obviously also level one, uh, level two, which is mid, will be also interested about measuring and optimizing if needed. Obviously we need to know how to measure, we need to understand things uh, to know if it is needed, if the measurements shows us any need for optimizing or maybe we can just not care. <laughs> and yes, Mikhail, uh, there is a level zero for people that do, don't know uh, anything about the memory management and they can only write code and new app uh, um, objects. That's also fine. They are providing business values, uh, but uh, I invite them for sure <laughs> to be at least on one on level one. Okay, so uh, going further, uh, going further, uh, as, as I said, if we can learn about clean code to maintain it better, I'm really believing that we can write more performant code just to run and host it better. And it really doesn't mean you are in a, you are prematurely optimizing everything. It is just about some knowledge that will allow you to main, to omit some common mistakes, for example, and also have this feeling, okay, we have a memory leak. I know how to measure it and I immediately will have a uh, all knowledge in at hand to to see what's what's the reason that's not the magic knowledge <clears throat> and I also really really believe in software craftsmanship uh, so um, it is I'm not sure if you are you are aware of this software software craftsmanship manifesto let's open it <clears throat> Uh, I will open it here and you can even sign there because uh, uh, as I, far as I remember, I also signed there. But even without sign signing, you can just believe in it. Uh, it is about writing, uh, about being, being software craftsman. And uh, the very first thing here is then you are not only writing software, uh, which is working. So you are not only thinking about working software but trying to make it well crafted so we will be thinking about making well crafted software not only software that compiles and runs and this covers this the both performance i believe and clean code and other, other stuff uh, because it will be well crafted don't write things that allocate gigabytes to open a single file which is one megabyte for example that's not the you know like kind of magic knowledge also. Uh, so about those topics, if you're also interested, there is a second uh, webinar. So I will not, uh, I would rather avoid, I would like to avoid here repeating myself. There is a second webinar about why should I care about .NET GC? You can look at it. I'm covering there uh, similar talks and 
more broader context about all the stuff. So <clears throat> having said all that, uh, the pragmatic approach, what I mentioned, uh, I, I thought that the, there is a great idea and the great goal to, to be achieved. Make a book and now a course that will allow everyone uh, to be at this uh, at least mid level. Like I believe really that I, what I'm trying to do in .NET Memory Expert, uh, that after doing it, if you obviously watch the all the mo watch all the material, try to understand it, make all the exercises, repeat, then you will be really becoming solid mid level, like even aspiring sen senior level, because I'm covering there a lot of material just to make it happen. Is it, is it beneficial for you to to up, to be upgraded to mid level or aspiring senior level? That's the answer that you need to answer yourself. Obviously, even from the economical point of view, it will be benefit may be beneficial because you will be you, you will know better. You will be able to write better software and also diagnose it for your clients for your company. So. I believe it is economically reasonable. Also, it is uh, good for self-development in general. So that's that's the reason I believe we you can be interested. And I'm targeting here in this, uh, on the whole course is targeted to make it happen. It is not targeting the level four, I, I want, I don't want to overwhelm people with the knowledge that they will not need for everyday programming. Uh, because not everyone is writing their own GCs. And uh, maybe there should be different webinar, the different course, or maybe set of webinars. One of the examples is this series that I created, which is about .NET GC internals. It is totally free uh, because it is just targeting this level of people. Like they are want, they really want to learn things that are how they are working internet, how they are implemented. Uh, you can watch it. This course is uh, somehow targeted for level two and three. Like, I mean, it is targeted for every level, but it is to happen that you will be at the level three or two and a half uh, after after watching it. I hope it will happen, and I hope I will start to get such a feedback afterwards. That, that I would be super happy to see that. So, having all that uh, said. That's the that's the that's the product. Like uh, I created this .NET Memory Expert course, which is exactly about that. It is all about memory management, because there are some books, there are some materials, tutorials, uh, which are sometimes mentioning memory management. But I believe it is so huge topic, and now a dog is barking, that uh, <clears throat> you will just. It, it is a lot to cover. So the whole course is absolutely full of knowledge and it is uh, even not, I'm not even able to cover probably everything that I would like to, to make it happen, barking again. So uh, what's inside having all that? Uh, what, what's inside the, the idea, how to produce something that will allow you to do that? Uh, the very first thing is it is b pretty big. <laughs> I need to shout, say louder than the dog outside. Maybe it will stop too. Okay. Uh, so it is uh, 13 modules uh, covering all these things that I believe are important and should be covered to make this happen that you are at least a level two or three. And what is nice that it is starting today. So we have today, we publish today the very first module. Uh, we will see in a moment what about about what it is, but it is already available. So if you have bought, bought the course during the pre-sale or maybe you are both you will boot, boot, buy it during this week, you will immediately get the access to the first week. Uh, we are calling this week because this is on a weekly basis, uh, because we don't want to overwhelm people with the knowledge. Those modules are split at two weeks and simply you will <coughs> uh, 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 receive next module every week. And uh, as far as I remember, the whole thing will end in the middle of January because there are so many modules that it is like two and a half months of learning for you uh, about this topic. 
and uh, that's nice. The thing is that I started with nine modules, and the pre-sale was saying uh, and um, saying, uh, let's say, promising nine modules. But during the work on those modules, I found that some are so big that they should be simply split to make it a, a better pace of learning. So now, uh, eventually, we have 13 modules. Then, <clears throat> what is inside such a module? So each module consists of around three hours of material, uh, which is a video re recorded with my face and slides and uh, the screen uh, recorder recordings also. It consists of presentations and demos, and so you if they are i have sometimes questions how much time i should dedicate per week when i decide to have it this it will be around three four hours uh, because there is additionally a homework and it is really depending on you how how you would be involved in that and um, some i expect most of it it will take uh uh, you should expect like half an hour, hour to, to make it, but there are some optional modules in your homework and you can also always expand and dig in more and experiment more. So it is up to infinity in the end how, how long the homework will make. I perceive it as an important part because obviously you can listen to me for three hours and you will be nodding and saying, okay, okay, that's obvious, okay, that's even more obvious, uh, okay, okay. But then you need to start to experiment with all that stuff and that's why we have those homeworks. I really believe in the, they are really needed. Obviously, there is also a set of, uh, set of links for further reading to even um, if you are still angry of no, uh, uh, have this knowledge anger, uh, you will be able to read more. But that's the main part, like the, those three, around three hours of material per every week. There uh, we have some additional modules, like we have two mentors uh, that will provide uh, <clears throat> their own material about the same topics. I decided and I uh, happily they they agreed uh, to invite two well-known persons in .NET community. So the very first is Christoph. It is a well-known speaker. If you have ever seen any conference like update.next and then DC or any other, Christoph uh, and Kevin, typically they are doing that together, but sometimes not. Uh, we uh, covering very deep, nice talks about diagnostic and other stuff, uh, covering also um, memory management. So I'm super happy he, he agreed. And also I have Andre, which is from Russia and he is an author of benchmark.net. So the, the, the tool about uh, the tool about measuring. If you have ever do something in performance, if you have seen an article about performance, like previous, like currently there is a .NET 6 performance improvement, huge article written by Stephen Taupe, for sure you see their tables showing you the difference in performance. Those tables are created by benchmark.net. Benchmark.net has been created by Andre. So I'm super happy he's uh, he agreed to be a mentor during the course. And uh, some additional modules like the QA and a session with me and also uh, maybe something in the future, we will see. I'm thinking about modules like if the .next 7 will, be, will become available, we can create a module that will show the differences and so on. So um, it is at least 13 modules, but it will be growing probably. <clears throat> Uh, okay, uh, and going further, that's not the end because uh, uh, besides the, all those materials, you have also access to the community and I really believe in discussion between you, not only with me, but between you. It really depends on the community, how active you are, but there is a community dedicated for you so you can ask questions, discuss, and uh, make some open any discussion related to the stuff. It is for the participants simply. And all this is in a lifetime access. So you shouldn't be worried that you won't be able to catch up in this pace of four hours per week, for example, because when you get it, it is available for you forever. So you have the whole life for watching it. Obviously, I invite you to make it a little bit faster <laughs> because then you will be able to benefit from it. But still, uh, all the upgrades that will happen, all the material uh, will be simply uh, present, uh, available for you uh, 
uh, until uh, the whole platform and until the whole course so in general the, the lifetime access that you have here is is a nice thing so this in the end what you have like over 50 hours of material uh, homeworks additional um, content from uh, mentors q a uh, all about dotnet memory so you can start to think okay i'm doing my programming like five ten years and i haven't touched the dc topic at all and here is this guy saying that he created uh, 15 hours uh material about that so what what the hell <laughs> why why who who is who is uh in, let's say <laughs> misfooled here why why i'm not doing less how how it may happen that there is so much to talk and i haven't learned about it at all um uh, so yes the question from uh, G or i don't know how to spell it Gar gorgios you can you can that's always problem uh, the presentation and demos are pre-recorded just to make it uh just to make it simply better for you because it just improves the quality we can make fixes cut and things and to repeat them so they are they are pre-recorded uh including demos yes um uh, and uh, first first the uh, module as you speak is uh, almost three hours okay uh, so let's uh, let's see the content what, what's there in the end uh, because i said there is over 15 minutes 15 15 hours so let's make a very fast uh, grasp about the topics there uh with me so 13 hours and uh, 13 modules uh I will be talking about that, but I spent weeks about thinking how to structure it to make it good. Because, you know, when you design something like that, the, the design is super important thing, like uh, how to structure things that uh, will allow to introduce not too many things at the same time, that they do not overlap, but on the other hand, many things here requiring knowing other things that cannot be introduced because we need to introduce something at first and so on. So it is not so trivial to structure all this thing and uh, the very nice question yeah yes the very nice question what's what what can we see there that is not in the book i will cover that question that super valid question and uh, so stay with me uh, because in general a lot <laughs> like the spoiler answer is a lot a different thing so agenda now, the very first module that is available this week is about the dotnet runtime and types basics because we need we cannot just jump in into the gc gc is living in some context and this context is the dotnet runtime so i'm uh, besides some simple introduction there i just giving over two hours uh, talk about the dotnet runtime itself like what is il what is jit what is an assembler produ produced there and uh, what it is all related to dotnet memory that's super important i'm not doing i'm not uh, trying to say anything that will be not relevant uh, just for saying it everything that i'm trying to say there is relevant for memory management and we will return for example in il in some other modules so some nice introduction to il i find it uh, important the second module about types so uh, if you have ever seen the question uh, the recruitment question about what is the difference between between value type and reference type for example or what is created on the stack or on, on the heap those are the two modules that i'm uh, solely dedicated to that stuff and uh, it's still um, a lot of a lot of thing uh, to cover there <clears throat> then some introduction about the memory management in general why automatic memory management is important again some theory is needed here but it is all relevant and then a super important module about how you can perceive gc in general what are the pauses throughput latency aggressiveness of the gc how they relate to the, to the application that you are doing and also what's your final performance goal and how you should perceive it then we have a module about the dotnet gc itself 
about its modes and uh, then we have a huge module about tools because i cannot move further before showing you some tools that you will allow you to measure things including including um, events counters um, analyzing dumps and uh, how it uh, all is uh, put inside context of, for example, dockerized applications or cloud applications. Uh, and then we are moving to another stuff important like the roots, like local variables, statics, how you can unload an assembly and what problems it can produce. Uh, and here this thing that I would like to stop for a while because there is a solely the, the the module dedicated only to the internals and the internals is something that i really need to fight with because i really love like uh, i'm i know a lot about gc let's say and i know i love to share knowledge about how it is implemented yeah, but on the other hand i'm fully aware that most people simply don't care and um, I was really fighting with this temptation that uh, I would like to, I would, I should put GC internals here and there and here and there because it is so fun to know. But in the end, it would be just an overhead knowledge that is not important for you. So I shrinked all the thing and get rid of everything that is really not needed, put it inside, you know, closed in, inside a one module that is about the only necessary part of internals that I believe every .NET developer will benefit to know. And that's all on the single modules. Other modules are trying not to mention the internals not to, because first of all, it is not so important for you. Secondly, just to have, just to fight with this temptation, I for purpose uh, created this free set of webinars about GC internals so there, there is a second set of free stuff that you can watch and it doesn't make sense to repeat it in this course and i'm happy with this with this solution i would say the next module is the heart of the course because there i'm covering the typical problems uh, so memory leaks and um, that's the very first thing that people find like, when they are trying to learn dotnet memory management okay we have memory leaks but we have various types of memory leaks some of them are not really leaks but are a result of not understanding gc so for example we may have memory growing because the gc is simply not happening and if someone doesn't know it will be treating it as a memory leak and it will be not uh, but you can control it, for example, if this mem growth of memory is problematic for you. So memory leaks, also topic of fragmentation, the real memory leaks because of some roots, how you can diagnose them and what are the typical problems related to that. Nepotism problem, I will leave it here as a kind of mysterious, mystery, mystic uh, name uh, to, to Google. And then also super nice module, because when talking about performance, like folks like David Fowler or any other performance related fan will say, we should not allocate or we should reduce allocations. So the whole module just about that, how you can reduce allocations. Uh, so a uh, really code driven module about controlling allocations, obviously also measuring them, but also various types of allocations, including many hidden uh, sources of allocations and then how you can avoid them. And that's uh, that's something that we, we are ending here at the code level of allocations. The next module is about the lifetime management. So super well-known disposable pattern for example or finalization what it is what problems it may cause in the end when do we need really uh, finalizers because i see a lot of confusion about i disposable what is this dispose doing and why do we need to finalizer uh, do we need it at all and so on so though this is the module that will answer all those questions it may be not so performance related more about controlling the lifetime also from the perspective of uh, dependency injection because it may i was analyzing memory leaks because of a misconfigured dependency injection so <clears throat> uh, a little bit of lifetime management in this module and this module 10 is probably something that the level one is 
really really need need to cover and understand and have it uh, in the brain encoded hard coded even um then uh, th the last three modules are for this next level if you are really aspiring senior and then the advanced topics like first of all it umbrella term like this is a module about advanced topics and ipi so if you have a seen span and this all fools about the span that span is nice what is span why we should use span what is unsafe class uh, what is the manage pointer and all this ref usage why there are so many incoming features in c-sharp that are covering passing by reference because there are many and they are even designed like recently uh, recently uh, we have seen some proposals what will what may be added in c-sharp 11 regarding ref uh, ref and span so a lot of ongoing stuff is going there and while there was uh, one side one maybe one remark here when the span was added it was something that i agree i was presenting like kind of okay that's super fun that's for high performance code but most of the developers should not care or maybe will not care that was the f initial narration that we have but i th that this changing because we are seeing more and more api that's starts to use span and uh, we will believe i believe more and more people will really need to understand why it is so beneficial how we can make usage of it uh, where this new api is and for what so that's becoming more and more important to have a good feeling about these advanced topics also even if you will be writing even regular business applications you will start to see more and more span based apis like for serialization for maybe databases and so on and so on on the basis of this module the next one is about data oriented design this is a kind of special design uh, of the software that is uh, all around the memory access and uh, to make it efficient so how the memory is utilized what is the relation be and what between the cpu and memory what is the cache how you can utilize the cache or how you can abuse the cache because your code is re written in a bad way how you can design software that will be fast because it access your uh, data in efficient manner so all the things like that will be in this module uh, not for super typical business applications but hey we are here at the level of senior so uh, they should be interested uh, about that too and the very last module is about interoperability hard word uh, so pinning like why we would like to pin an object to have an address of it uh, utilizing for example memory map files native allocations so move things off the heap also so meaty things like function pointers a lot of like low level stuff that is closer to the bare metal and uh, to the calling for example unmanaged stuff but still for senior that's the knowledge that uh, for sure should be at least have some overall overall point of view about this stuff so still super beneficial so as you see a lot of things and uh, at the very beginning people may think that 13 modules for over 50 hours of material that guy just gone crazy and it is not so necessary but in the end i believe it is like <laughs> there is a lot of stuff stuff to cover and uh, just uh, about that and I was even fighting with me uh, to not put his he, here or there something additional you know topics because i would not end this course ever so for sure something should be <coughs> truncated okay so uh, if you have any questions regarding this topics regarding the course what's there why what what's not there just do not hesitate to ask obviously the chat is for you i'm looking at the chat all the time so i will immediately answer without any pauses and then the question about me like the author uh, why uh, okay jose uh, do you talk about apps absolute gc in my course no because this is on this expert level like <laughs> if you would like to write your own gc that would be the topic that uh, people will be interested so uh, how to write your own gc and put it inside the dotnet runtime 
maybe maybe i will sometime create an additional module about that like for people interested in that or maybe i will just create a free uh, lessons on the web on on youtube for for that we will see but that that's not the level of uh, that people will be interested probably to cover writing your own uh, custom dc so so that's not there and i'm even proud of it because it means i really tried to make it uh pragmatic like if it is fun for me to talk about it but you will not benefit struggling my with myself but i'm getting rid of it <laughs> so i get rid of epsilon gc uh, from this uh, from this course what's the price uh, the price is like um, i've closed it so the price is like that it was cheaper during the pre-sale but current price is like that so i would say that's pretty typical price for online courses that we are seeing uh, for seeing um, on the market like it is huge amount of time a huge commitment i'm doing this full time for weeks for months i could say for year this is uh, i'm living about with, with this topic for sure so that's the price that is trying to reward me uh, uh, for all this work and it is pretty close to the price that you could have if company for example wants to buy similar thing on site to invite me and talk about the same stuff in your company so i hope it will be not too big for you <clears throat> okay <clears throat> the author like maybe i will fit in one hour that would be something new <laughs> but i will try probably it will not happen but let's try at least the author why i believe i'm good enough for for doing such stuff so first some reasons like i dedicated i'm dedicated to this topic for years like for seven years i'm really doing dotnet memory stuff in various companies and uh, i was solving various issues for various customers so I was helping clients to optimize their apps and solve some issues like reducing gigabytes of memory usage because of like fragmentation in large object heap or reducing DC pressure because there were pauses introduced by many allocations. So we were fighting with allocations or simply diagnosing memory leaks like unbounded uh, growth of memory and that was making a trouble or even throwing out of memory exception or even diagnosing strange dc issues like there are some there were some tools that were introducing for example a deadlock in the application and that's for probably for an expert level i'm not uh, expecting everyone after this course will be able to 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 diagnose deadlocks in the gc but the, fair, the the previous points are super valid so i my target is to teach you to be able to solve such kind of problems on your own that's pretty cannibalism <laughs> like even i'm i'm just giving myself less work by doing that because you after learning this you will won't be your companies won't be interested in calling me because you will learn you will be able to solve it on your own but let's say i i hope it will be a uh, beneficial for for it as a win-win situation for all and uh Currently, I'm, for example, helping Unity and their uh, Plastic SCM version control system. If someone from this company is looking at me now or watching the recording, hello, uh, trying to look what we can do there to make it more efficient in terms of DC and memory usage. Uh, also, I am written this book, so maybe you know, maybe not, but I, the very f after years of working on that stuff, I thought it would be nice to share this knowledge because there are some books and there is even uh, some internal performance related books in .NET, but there is a practically only a single chapter about it. Like, okay, we, here we have a chapter about GC but the, as you see there is so much things to cover that i, I, did, I did, decided to make a book about it and i've done it like it took me about three years to write it fortunately it is kind of i i can say success at least from the perspective of reviews as you can see on the amazon um it also has been translated to various languages that currently it is translated to russia to polish and uh, to chinese and uh, maybe it will be translated to different languages so i don't know 
I saw the questions about comparing it to a book, and that's uh, that's super super valid question. So what is the difference? The difference is all those years that has passed during the time when I was doing this uh, work at the book. So the topic is the same, but everything else is restructured. Uh, question, how long is your course? Uh, so it is 13 modules. Uh, it In total, it is around, it will be around 50 hours of material, something like that. That's the answer. Uh, so yeah, obviously the whole it is it is um, like building uh, each on another. So from the experience from my first companies when I was involved on that topic, I wrote the book. After writing the book, I was doing even more uh, um, consultancy job that I gathered some more experience that I can put in the course. That is the result of it. Uh, also, all the time, uh, all that time, I was dedicated to sharing knowledge about it. So I've given countless talks uh, about on various conferences about that stuff, about GC, about high performance patterns. I created this .NET GC internal series, uh, some webinars like this .NET GC tips and trick series that I'm also planning to develop further in in future so all these things that i've done after book publication is a kind of refreshment in my head how how you can really share this knowledge and all this is put inside the course uh, it is not a simple screening of my book like let's make the same structure and put all the same knowledge it is absolutely different uh, so I'm active on Twitter also saying about all this stuff and every time when I'm every time during the last three years after the book publication when I was doing something like a talk or a infographic or a poster all this knowledge was just a kind of additional note on this project online course and then uh, when I started to make it I processed all these findings and ideas that I had during uh, during the uh, that time and i was i i can say that it is so much findings that the the second edition about the book that probably eventually will happen needs to be rewritten like <laughs> i'm happy with the result but after all those years after the feedback from people that i get i believe it can be structured better so I have a problem because it is 1000 pages <laughs> and now should I write it from scratch or maybe copy paste it in a different order? I don't know, but this is the difference. Moreover, during all those years after book publication, I've given dozens of on-site workshops, uh, including related to .NET memory. So I've learned how you can teach, uh, sometimes with hard way, like not always it was only super positive feedback. But I had feedback, so there was a huge, um, because I was giving the, let's say, prototype version of this uh, training that we have seen here. Or on the other hand, we can say that this online course is the version 2.0 of workshops that I was giving um, for companies, for example. And uh, if all this feedback is just put inside this version 2.0. So what I could change, what should be added, what was not needed. It gathered all the feedback about how I can share the knowledge about it in more pragmatical and practical way. That's that's the main, main target direction that I have here. So the feedback was in general positive. People were satisfied by all, but always there was something to improve. And all these points are living inside this final product that we can buy now. Like it is really second two, like two zero or 3.0 version of the book that is uh, absolutely <clears throat> restructured. Moreover, even from the perspective of online courses, I learned a lot because during that time I was not sleeping and watching how the book is selling. But I was, for example, heavily involved in authoring different online courses. So we have authored as .NETOS Async Expert, which has a few hundred participants. So we have learned a lot how you can make 
online course, how you can produce it in a good way, in a good quality. If someone of you is an, uh, attending any of these courses, I hope you are finding it nice and useful. C Sharp Professional, and I also I was also helping Sebastian to author .NET Diagnostic Expert. So I learned a lot about how you can produce a good online course. Like it is not a book, it is something different, different narration, different dynamics, different structure, more examples, demos. Um, animations and all this stuff, and me talking even, uh, you know, the different flow of uh, showing things, that's totally different thing, like the same knowledge, but from absolutely different perspective. And thanks to those courses, I was able to do that. Like, <laughs> they are great, and every course learns us uh, something more. So uh, even after .NET Memory Expert, probably I will have another findings what can be improved. The more courses we made, the better they are. And here we are at least at the four course in a row. So I'm really believing it makes it better simply. And even more, the book was published at the times of .NET 2.1 and then 3.0 was coming. Uh, so the GC doesn't, haven't changed a lot during this time, but there are some changes and there are some new APIs. The span and the refs are more important. Uh, the better APIs, the diagnostic stuff is different because we have events and we have, we have event pipes, we have CLI diagnostic tools that was not covered in the book because it was not existing at that time. So I added all this stuff, like what is in .NET 5, what is in .NET 3.1, what let's say will be in .NET 6 uh, soon, and uh, more Linux, like uh, Linux support for .NET Core, especially from the perspective of diagnostic was really, really bad at the time of book writing. Now it is better. So I'm covering this in this course. Uh, more Docker, more cloud also, because I wanted to make it, <clears throat> again, more pragmatic. And I was also restructuring all the stuff. So when I was just developing it at some time, I just make this that I created this a lot of a lot of uh, cards and I put it all on the table and started to shuffle them uh, until I was satisfied with the flow of sharing knowledge. So how I should put all those topics. Uh, from the book, like I will imagine I throw all the pages from the book on the table and started to reorganize it to make it more practical and have different pace of introduction things. For example, uh, just to give you an example, uh, there is a topic about uh, how physically GC is cooperating with the operating system. So we have topics like uh, pages, virtual memory, physical memory, and uh, loader heap and managed heap uh, and other stuff segments important things to know but in the book it is at the beginning in my first version of trainings it was at the beginning i found it and also people found it a little bit confusing because uh, people want to learn stuff about dotnet not about operating systems uh, so it is not a good starting point. Like in the book, which it has a kind of more of academical flow when we are really starting from theory to even more practical theory to operating system than another theory, that's good pace of knowledge, of sharing knowledge for a book. For a training, not. And that's why, for example, I decided to move it uh, to one of the latest later uh, modules like now it is in this part about gc internals so i will just get there some knowledge that you will need to know after learning a lot more about the gc itself about its modes and so on and so on so i restructured all this in the book it has totally different order as you see also i was really concerned about those bridges so what you so the pe what the people need to know to understand stuff sometimes uh, there are kind of impossible problems because you need to talk about for example server gc to talk about managed heap but then you need to describe managed heap to mention server gc so you need to make some choices and there are some bridges like 
pretty often in the course I'm saying, okay, at this moment, you need to know this and we will return it with bigger details in next module, for example, or one of the next modules. And uh, restructuring, restructuring it, uh, I found it super, super good thing. Like I'm pretty uh, super satisfied with the result, with the flow of the things, uh, with all this agenda, how things are introduced uh, next after another uh, to not confuse people. And again, the thing that I get rid of most of the internals <laughs> also found it satisfying that I was able to do that for you to make it more practical so uh, so yeah so that's the the thing that's that's how it is uh, structured and um, again if you have any questions um, do not hesitate to ask and also I would like to show you kind of sneak peeks like what's there how the modules look for example so um, let's say that here I have a module which is about the, the first module the one which is uh, already available uh, so you can watch it and it is about the runtime and there uh, i like Dravix. like have you I, I, have you i have sorry as you've seen i like creative stuff like i like photography i like lego i like drawing also so i like make i like making graphics and drawings so there is a lot of drawings there because i believe one picture really can explain things much faster than thousand slides and words uh, so there here, are, for example, a slide about the whole .NET ecosystem for people starting or just a kind of reminder how it is structured, what are the building blocks, what is the relation between C Sharp, IL, JIT, native code, what is inside, uh, how it is the relation between uh, all of that and operating system, for example. And I'm simply so showing this, describing uh, to, 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 to give you this overall uh, high level uh, point of view. Then I would like, for example, to explain you um, the IL. So I'm taking a sample method and I'm just explaining uh, a sample C sharp method, and I'm explaining how it does look in IL, uh, instruction by instruction, explaining simply what is happening, what th is the model of the IL, and in the end, obviously, uh, uh, there is a, a JIT, like how it will be in the end looking at the assembly level. I agree, that's pretty low level. People might be scared, but I really try to put it in a practical way so you don't have to learn assembly afterwards or before to understand those slides. This is simply to give you a pretty solid understanding of the .NET runtime. And the very nice, uh, the, 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 let's say the last thing where it is, it is worth to know IL, for example, from this perspective, when it is worth to know IL. So this is the module that is not super memory related, but as I said, it is a foundation for sharing all this stuff uh, later on. Or for, uh, and homework, for example, um, the homework for first module, the one that is available currently, is uh, just uh, to play. To, to uh, I'm asking you to play with uh, .NET a little to understand, for example, various various publishing modes of the .NET runtime, uh, and uh, as a second task to play with understanding IL a little, uh, even to play with F Sharp a little. Uh, just to make to make you going uh, from the comfort zone for a moment and even for a hardcore participants to write something in IL uh, and try to writing something in IL and that's the runtime part but also uh, uh, the let's say module 6 module 6 is about uh, local variables statics and other routes and here i'm presenting for example uh, what's the object graph what is the root root path the shortest root path what they are important why they people may be confused here uh, so uh, simply to make common understanding of those terms that then later you will see in tools and we were using tools in the previous module a lot so i was presenting there uh, other stuff like we can look for example about the module about um, uh, about about uh, let's me just open the module about the tools and it 
let's say for example that i would like to give you uh, tools about um, event pipes what they are uh, what is the relation between the event pipes and cli diagnostic tools so every time i i would love to introduce some background what 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 why it was added since when how it is called how it is working a little how it is working for you for example the idea of the diagnostic port because you will have maybe some problems and some tools even at some points will uh, require you to set it manually if you will be diagnosing in some not so common scenarios so a little bit of knowledge about that and then description of various diagnostic tools for example and obviously all the all of this is presented in the dotnet memory um, specific way so if there is a demo i will be just showing uh, usage of those tools for dotnet memory for dotnet application in various scenarios to look what we can get there in terms of uh, memory management observing gc and so on and so on so uh, there is a there that that's that that's uh, what I want to show. Sorry, <laughs> I was just trying to read the chat during the uh, talking, which is not so um, fortunate. Mm, yes, uh, the thread pool top, uh, topic I see. <clears throat> .NET six uses a new thread pool that is managed. That's right. The doc says that we can change back to the native yes so this is called uh so-called uh, the configuration knob uh, most of them are available only through environment variables the one that are most important more important are also available in configuration like in the project file or maybe even in the runtime json file but those more cryptic let's say are available to through uh, through the thread pool <clears throat> and that's uh, <laughs> sorry, no, not through the thread pool, but through, by through the uh, environment variable. Okay, and regarding demos, for example, uh, okay, you have asked about environment variables, so that's pretty good point uh, to show you one of the examples that I'm using uh, during the demos. There is an application memory leak that is, by the way, available on GitHub and I'm using it because I found it really, really nice for various demonstrations. So we have an application that, uh, let's say, okay, just give a second. Uh, that is running uh, something and uh, it is a, ASP.NET Core application written in .NET 5. We can look what's there. And the nice thing about this tool is that it simply shows uh, the shows the statistics of the memory. It is self-diagnosing. I'm also describing how you can write such an application to self-diagnose your app, of, of obviously. So uh, you, I, you, in one of the homeworks, I even ask you to extend this tool with some additional graphs. To make deeper analysis of memory but as far as a member that one is optional and okay so we have this graph application is running as you see it is all in allocating almost nothing so we see here working set which is an overall memory usage of the process which is around almost 80 megabytes and allocated which just shows what is the amount of the managed memory allocated in this process and the graph is consuming some memory so you see here a little bit of increase of the allocated part and the working set but it is not a big increase uh, let's create a load test and now what i'm doing here is just i'm calling the method a big string on this web api uh, which is just allocating some big string in a loop and i'm doing this a lot of time per second as you see with the help of this load test tool i'm doing this almost 600 uh, requests per second and as you see memory is growing right so memory is growing and uh, we don't see any decrease of until now decrease of memory and this is a perfect example of the gc so-called aggressiveness because gc i'm having 64 mega gigabytes of memory on my machine so it is a lot uh, like just to confirm i have 64 gigabytes of memory so 
uh, the GC is super happy with the all available memory and it doesn't have, doesn't feel the need of releasing this memory. So uh, in this particular mode, as we see, the memory will grow up to a few hundreds. It really depends. It will fine tune to the load. I'm also describing how it fine, fine tune and why, but we see this pattern like uh, after a few hundreds of allocations, GC kicks in and it releases memory and the whole story continues. That's nice. And uh, then uh, we can change the GC mode, uh, for example, for this application. So let's change it. We can change GC mode in various ways. One of the ways is using environment variable. Uh, that's very similar to the one that you have shown. Uh, so there is a GC mode variable, environment variable, uh, which is, I will make it bigger, which is called GC server. This is a flag saying that our application sh should run in so-called GC mode or not, which is called workstation mode. And then we have this flag. Uh, we can use it, for example, in Docker environments, which is nicely configured by environment variables. Obviously, also, it can be in in case of this particular setting, we can use a uh, configuration in file, like in the runtime run JSON for, uh, configuration and so on. But let's use here uh, environment variable. So I'm setting it to zero. Uh, so it now will be read when the application starts, when the runtime is kicked off, it will see that this environment, uh, environment variable is set, which means I don't want to use server GC, I want to use uh, the workstation GC. Okay, and I'm running it, and now we will see a different behavior. Obviously, now nothing is happening because our load test has ended. So let's start the same, exactly the same load test again against exactly the same application. And we see totally different behavior. So because what we see here is a much bigger aggressiveness of the GC. Workstation GC was designed to be a uh, nice citizen. It doesn't want to use a lot of memory because it is a for kind of desktop application. So uh, that's the thing. Uh, we don't want to consume a lot of memory because probably there are only other interactive desktop applications on our machine. And we see here this very, very typical uh, pattern uh, of memory being uh, reclaimed periodically. Those triangles here are marking the GC. The green one was are the Gen 0 GC, the Gen 1 GCs are yellow. Now a little bit of knowledge, what is the generation and so on. But, and I'm also explaining why it is happening that they are having occasional Gen 1 Gen, Gen, GCs and most Gen 0 GCs and so on. But as we see what we have achieved, exactly the same application, exactly the same load test, but much, much smaller memory usage because it is constantly smaller be below uh, some particular uh, value that current GC with the current condition has decided to be at that level. Uh, so we are co calling GC much often, which makes it much more aggressive because it reduces and uh, mm, reclaims memory much often. So it is also um, not allowing to grow it to have big numbers. <laughs> Obviously, there is a drawback. Like now we are calling GC much more, much more often. So it will simply uh, introduce some pauses and we will see a different uh, results, for example, on the throughput level. So now it is this whole thing about goal levels and how you can measure it. Uh, what is your performance goal? That is one in one of the one of the modules. And uh, there are other settings. Uh, so even without touching the GC, even without touching the uh, you know the code itself, you can control and influence GC tremendously from this perspective. Just to show you a very last example, I can trigger GC server. Uh, I can configure server GC once again, but there is something which is called heap count. And heap count will be saying how much parallelize I want, how, how much parallel should be the work of the GC. Uh, by default, it uses all the cores, uh, so the whole machine will be uh, dedicated, let's say, and 
doing the GC when it will happen, but I can reduce it. Um, as, a, as I mentioned, I have this machine here, which is 64 gigabytes, but also it has, as, uh, it has uh, 32 cores. So when the GC happens, all the cores will be uh, busy because of that. Maybe I don't want that. Maybe I want to make this a little bit more aggressive. Uh, maybe I want to dedicate only eight or let's say four cores. Let's see what will happen if I will set it. So uh, what I'm seeing here, setting here is now that I'm uh, with the help of this environment variable, I'm saying I want to have only four cores dedicated to the GC and uh, to make it less parallel in work. Let's see what will happen when we start it. Um, okay, but it would be good to run it. <coughs> so let's run the application. Okay, the load test is happening, and uh, and what we see is we see here a kind of oh compromise. The memory is not growing to five, six hundreds, hundreds as previously. It is happening much, a little bit less frequently, and the memory is half of it. Like we have controlled the aggressiveness of the GC with the help of a single flag. The GC is happening less frequently, but it is happening. So the memory is cut to 300 megabytes instead of six or seven hundreds. And it may be good setting for our application to control both memory usage and uh, uh, the overall influence on the GC from the GC on the application. So yeah, that's, that's like, I'm showing this demo now, which is the demo taken from the course itself uh, to show uh, these experiments and I'm also inviting you to similar uh, place in one of the homeworks, for example, to play with it and have this uh, knowledge about how you can really control the GC, as you see, even without touching the code. Obviously, changing the code will be the different way of influencing your DC because DC is driven by the uh, code in the, by your application. So in the end, what your code is doing will influence uh, the, uh, the GC and its influence on the application. <coughs> uh, have you already changed uh, the limit of 85 kilobyte? I mean, I'm not sure why I, I why I should change it. Like you can change it. There, there is a there is a log threshold for for doing that. So uh, we can. There is this concept of large object heap where big objects are created. And for many years since the very beginning of the .NET, it was a hard coded limit. It was eighteen five thousand bytes. But since .NET 3.3, if so the .NET Core 3.0, as far as I remember, you can configure it. You can make it bigger, for example. And why you can change it? Why you can need it to change it? That's a very good question, obviously. <laughs> and um, I'm answering uh, on uh, on it. On I will answer to this question. I am answering to this question in one of the modules, obviously. Uh, it is if you have a lot of objects which are allocated there and large object heap has their own caveats, like it introduced fragmentation and it is not compacted by default. So it may happen that large object heap will grow because you have some objects like are not 85, a thousand bytes but for example 100 bytes or 200 bytes and uh, if you if you load a lot of a data do something with that and discard this uh, that may happen that a lot of this data will be created in large object heap and uh, gc will simply have troubles with uh, reclaiming memory from there. Like it, it, will, it will reclaim memory, it will try to reuse this free space, but in the end, the fragmentation may, might grow and you will see gigabytes of data as a, an empty data there. And that would be sad because you will be paying for gigabytes of garbage, which in some scenarios may be not so, uh, maybe not so, 
put simply. So you can control it in the end. And there is, as far as I remember, also the large object heap. Yeah, large object heap uh, endpoint in this demo with, that we are also using uh, to play with exactly with this stuff, like to play with the large object heap uh, threshold. And one of the consequences that I haven't mentioned yet is that large object heap is treated as a generation tool, let's say. So if you would like to clean stuff in large object heap, you need to trigger the full GC, the one that will collect all the memory from all the other generations, the black ones here. So as you see, because we are using this endpoint that allocates in large object heap, we are triggering Gen 2 GCs all the time, and they are really costly. Uh, so unfortunate uh, pattern is happening, at, uh, as we see. We allocate a lot of stuff there, and we, because of that, we trigger all the time, we trigger full GCs to collect this memory. So we don't have memory leak, uh, but uh, unfortunately, we trigger full GCs, and there will be a cost if we if we also measure it from the perspective of, for example, pause times. We will see probably that they are much bigger that we would like to have. And okay, mm, one and a half hour. Uh, so probably we should slowly summarize uh, the things here. So let's return to the to the presentation. Uh, and the last slide is that that's all. <laughs> uh, thank you for, for being with me. But obviously, you can still have some more questions, so do not hesitate to ask. I see one more. When your course will be available uh, for buying again? I believe like, like it is available currently, so you can buy it this week. <clears throat> but I expect you know this. So you are asking when it will be available again after this week and then the answer is i'm not sure uh, <laughs> because we haven't decided like we are doing this although it is mine a soul uh, let's say uh, work uh, to create this course in terms of um, the content it is all authored by our company .netos, and we need to decide in our schedule where it will be available again and typically we do the open the second time after few months uh, after the first sale so if we do that in the classical way you could expect opening again like in march but i'm not sure like it hasn't been decided so we will see hello mikram vikram sorry <clears throat> uh Hmm. Yes, I mean, the whole course is about the memory management behavior, <laughs> mostly uh, for web apps, because we are mostly doing web apps, but I'm not remember uh, forgetting about desktop apps, like there are some memory leaks presented in WPF, for example, and demos in console applications. All the thing here is typical for most of the applications, but I agree, web apps have different characteristics because they are have different lifetime uh, of the request. And um, that's something different than uh, all the time living desktop application with all the time living main window. We may be exposed to different problems for different memory leaks and also the cache. Like in web applications, the cache is always may be the problem <laughs> because the cache is something that GC doesn't like so much and in the end we can have with problems with cache too so in answering your question yes i all i'm showing this all the time in all my talks webinars and book and also in this course so so yeah uh, and after buying my course, it will be available all the time. So it will be, it has the lifetime access. Uh, it will be available since the end of the world. <laughs> and then uh, it will be even upgraded. So if we will decide to add some module, for example, with the changes of .NET 6, it will be added there and all the participants will be having 
access to these upgrades with there will be no you know second edition no paid dlcs like in game industry all the time upgraded the same uh, thing uh okay and yes john answered answered it already but i haven't noticed so uh, and that's um in short uh, oil for life exactly <clears throat> Okay, uh, if you don't have any more questions, I have one also last, super last um, um, answered question to you, uh, where it is hiding. Maybe you know, maybe not. I, I'm currently working on this material because you need to know that not all has been yet recorded. I'm just doing this stuff all the time and a lot of, of it is prepared, but I'm also doing an, uh, I, I, I like adding and adding and adding all the time more and more. So the question for you is, uh, do you see a memory leak hiding? Oh, and I see a typo here. So do you see a memory leak here in this slide? Uh, because it, there is a memory leak taken, uh, taken in one of the customers that had it so if you have watched this probably you discover this pattern uh, so thank you for providing a nice example of memory leak and why you are trying to find this memory leak i can also mention that maybe i haven't mentioned it clearly really enough but uh, the thing is that the thing is that all this stuff is also based from my practical experience like when i'm presenting memory leaks or common mistakes it is not like i'm sitting uh, and thinking okay so probably this will be a problem or maybe that will be a problem <laughs> i'm doing this exactly opposite like i'm just listening listing all my of all the problems in which i help and i'm putting there like uh, as uh, examples <clears throat> like moving of, of examples and uh, making examples simply out of this uh, making uh, list of the common problems based on the stuff that i really met and was fighting with that that's maybe i haven't said it clearly enough and i'm pretty proud of it because i rather don't like materials when the author is just imagining imaging imagining stuff uh memory leak here get platform code yes get platform code uh the get platform code uh, is a uh, is is there is the source of the memory leak but uh why as you are asking i'm uh, answering with another question <laughs> and by the way it cannot be moved because it depends on the thing that we are filtering like it is per row <clears throat> so um, it is not constant thing that could be um, i'm not seeing how it could be moved if it is just asking per row uh, to create a, a new object from every row that is in the result not seeing that Richard at least at the moment maybe I have a kind of webinar blind blindness uh, I, I need to drink uh, tea nothing stronger okay so uh, that's the good catch like is it serializable what is happening if we have something like that in the SQL query which is in the end somehow created here from this so I mean we need to have this gut feeling that something may be strange here because we are accessing here a database uh, by um, 
like uh, accessing uh, something like SQL query will be created here to access the data. And then we are newing up a new object based on this. And all this somehow will be translated to SQL query probably. And the question is what will be the relation between the things that are returned from the SQL query to the object that is later on created? Uh, <clears throat> And the thing is here that it is a problem, that this is uh, something that is uh, creating an expression that is cached by the SQL query machinery underneath. And it captures, unfortunately, this, <laughs> which means it captures uh, the object in which this method is living. And so that's pretty surprising because we are leaking some objects because of auto-generated SQL query that is executed here because we have a method that is somehow, as you are calling here, serialized to make this happen. <clears throat> and uh, that might be surprising. And one of the demos I'm showing how you can observe it and measure it and get to the conclusion. The thing is that it is magic, like, you are writing a super regular business code and in the end you are ending with the uh, uh, with the memory leak like everyone would write something like that and it doesn't sound like any problem and uh, and then muscle memory like master memory that i would like to teach uh, where are the potential problems when you are writing something and by the way, it has been fixed by the, if you will try to execute it in .NET 5, it will throw in an exception saying, sorry, but this is a memory leak driven <laughs> coding. Like you query will capture uh, this instance, which will leak. So .NET recognized this as a problem. And this particular problem is being solved in .NET 5 by an exception during at the execution time. Uh, while this query is created. So we are, in case of .NET 5, already uh, safe. But it is just as a kind of an example that even if you think that uh, you are safe because you are writing only super typical business code, it is not always true as a kind of a conclusion <laughs> for you. Uh, obviously, this may be a problem or not, depending how big the memory leak is, what is leaking, what's inside this instance. Because I believe many people said, I don't have any memory leaks. But they don't know. What they are really trying to say is that they don't observe any memory leaks, which may mean two things. They are not measuring them, or maybe their memory leaks are not severe enough that they are having this and observing this. Uh, which doesn't mean we are not leaking some memory. I have this perception that it is happening in WPF a lot, but people just don't care because there are some super small objects leaking there and the lifetime of an application is around one hour maybe or even shorter, so we don't care. But there are some and we are diagnosing them. So that was the very last slide. I will not make it any longer uh, because probably you want to eat some dinner or breakfast or whatever you are eating at time of this uh, where day or uh, time of the day where are you now? So that's all. That's a very last minute for you to ask any questions. Simply visit the site if you, if just look around if you find it interesting or not. Uh, that's totally up to you in the end whether you find it interesting or not just to make it easier for you a link on the chat to click to look around and uh, i hope we will see on the on the other side like on the side of the of the course if you are afraid that for example today this week you are not able to pay this amount of money because you have other expenses there will be the second openings for sure so it is not like now or never but our approach typical approach is that after the sale the price will be a little bit bigger so now it is this opportunity to big it at this price next price will be unfortunately little bigger it will be not not twice bigger but will be bigger 
so you can treat it as a kind of uh, opportunity to uh, buy, buy it cheaper and why well, i haven't mentioned that and uh, my, probably it makes super sense to make it uh, clearly uh, visible at this moment is that <clears throat> If you are afraid that you will not like it and okay it sounds interesting but you don't you are not sure that um, um, it will be interesting or maybe I will be speaking in a boring way and you will not li like it we have this uh, politics that you can return it so if you haven't watched more than 50 30 percent and the 30 days haven't passed since you're about it you can return it i hope it will not happen but don't treat it also like a lifetime decision <laughs> there is a path to return if you found it really disappointing at the very beginning uh, so you can look around we watch the first module and uh, then decide simply for example I hope it will not happen and you will really you will be bought by the content and how I present it but we have this policy it is possible okay I believe it is now perfect time to end thank you very much for being with me I hope you found it interesting uh, like the background in the end probably I will uh, use it for all my webinars the green screen is uh, just useful and that's all it was super nice to have you see you somewhere on twitter if you use twitter you can follow me i'm tweeting a lot of stuff about this so even if you not bow it you will have a lot of possibilities to watch what i am talking about it because i just can't stop doing that <laughs> i simply need to talk and uh, present stuff uh, for free too so somewhere on the internet probably we will meet and that's all thank you have a nice day bye and buy it <laughs> i haven't sent it directly buy this course you will not regret bye and